So, okay. So I'm like this kind of person where I get excited looking at people's faces. Uh, I'm constantly scanning for approval. So I'm like relying on you to have your camera uh, on so, uh, so I can see a, a reaction from your face just to see, you know, whether I'm doing okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm properly caffeinated. So my mind feels like it's going a million miles an hour. If you need me to slow down a little bit, you know, just raise your hand and just say G and call me G, like the letter G after the letter F. F for Fred, who is going to talk to you at, uh, you know, 90 minutes from now. Uh, so just say G, you got to slow down a little because I have a question. And so uh, I'd like this to be very interactive, very collaborative. I'm evoking the keyword already. So um, I welcome you to be a collaborator in this, uh, I don't know, talk, presentation, uh, just a party, collaborative brainstorm party. All right. So yeah, faces. Love it, love it, love it. All right. Um, First of all, uh, I'm just delighted to spend an hour or so with you uh, to explore a few ideas that, you know, that are important to me. You don't have to like them, but they're important to me. My hope is that, of course, you find some value in my value system, then my idea wouldn't be alone anymore. And I certainly want to hear about it if you want to tell me that I might be onto something, you've been thinking about similar things. It's just you haven't really been, you know, putting it into words or haven't had the opportunity to uh, execute your ideas. Um, and uh, if not, I still want to hear from you after this. Uh, like, what did I miss? Uh, what blind spots have you noticed? Uh, I'm just like everybody else. I'm, I'm full of blind spots. And there is no right or wrong in our discussion. And this is not about coming up with answers or finding solutions. In art, it has never been about solutions and answers. Um, and my money is on um, putting my finger on a few questions that are worth collective efforts. And if I'm lucky, uh, if we can do this together, uh, we might even find a pause. So let's begin, hey? Uh, I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen because I made a fancy slide. Very proud of it. Sharing computer sound and share. Hands up if you can see the title, Exploring Modalities. Yes, yes. All right. Wonderful. Um, yay. Works. All right. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. Um, I consider myself very fortunate uh, that I have had one amazing mentor after another. At the age of four, around four, so I was put in front of Yang Liqing, this um, cigarette smoking, uh, <laughs> handsome uh, older gentleman in the photo at the age of four. And he was one of those gentle giant of generosity. You know, uh, he's what I call the triple G effect. Oh, all puns intended. Isn't my name G? Woo. So, okay, this is the triple G effect. And I didn't care much about music at the time. I was four years old. I mean, cut me some slack, okay? I was like, I was the kind of four-year-old that I failed at being two and three. So I didn't even know how I got to be four. So I, uh, I didn't even, you know, understand what, what is, what, what am I supposed to do with this, with this music thing? Um, but Yang Liqing was different. Um, he wasn't miserable like everybody else in my life. So he quickly like, became my hero, my first hero. And you know what they say about first kiss. The same is true about first heroes. 
Uh, you know, if he told me to climb a tree, I'd go climb a tree. I don't even ask why. Uh, so he told me that I had to learn Bach. And I hated the fugue. I, I really, it just made me question whether I was born with, you know, insufficient amount of limbs. You know, I, I just could not handle counterpoint, could not handle voices more than three or four, two or three. Um, but I learned them all. I studied and I became a musician with absolutely no, no resentment about what I was asked to do and to sacrifice my childhood in order to achieve that level of musicianship that was demanded of me. Um, he knew that. He knew that um, whatever he asked me to do, he just asked very gently, hey, you do this next week, what do you think? And I do it. And he showed me that he knew me. He saw my potential by keeping me in his private studio for 16 years, uh, which uh, uh, many of you don't know who he was. He was uh, the first uh, Chinese composer uh, who went to Europe post-cultural revolution. And he was, uh, you know, very accomplished at the time, very accomplished composer came out of China and had a, a big splash in the Darmstadt in the East Germany uh, music scene. And he came back in 1984. And I was the very first student group of six that he uh, agreed to take on. And I was the only one, I was the only one he kept in his studio for 16 for 14, 14 years until I went to college uh, at 18 years old. And he was at the time uh, the president of Shanghai Conservatory of Music, uh, which uh, to this day is one of the top music schools in the world. Um, and so, you know, and I, I don't think you can have a relationship with anybody if the I guess the connection uh, was uh, suspicious. So um, whatever tied us together was felt by each and both of us at the same time. We both felt something together. Um, and it was something that I know that's fertile. And it defined me as a composer to this day. Things got... Um, a little bit uh, different when I turned 16, when I decided that uh, uh, the difference between life and death is music. Long story how I got to that uh, extreme point of view, but you know, in, in China, you, you have to have extreme point of view in order to stand out. Otherwise, you know, they just chop your head off. Uh, but, um, oh, oh yeah. And, and he was such an accomplished musician, uh, Yang Liqing. Anyway, so I was 16 and uh, um, all of a sudden, I, I, you know, I wasn't seen by Yang Liqing. I was seen by the, the Chinese, uh, I guess, repressive and very systematic uh, repression of individualism. You cannot say this. I cannot say this outside of this room. So please just keep it to yourself. Uh, I, I really didn't. I don't think I can, um, you know, survive that period of uh, repression where I was not supposed to love anything other than uh, what the party's agenda, what the party has assigned me to uh, to love, which is the love of the motherland. Um, and so, uh, boy, um, yeah, uh, those uh, who paid attention to me. I, if I were able to get any attention from anybody, they saw my aspiration to be a musician as a problem that needed to be handled. So they handled me uh, using one of the most uh, elegant, clean cut uh, administrative procedures where they expelled me uh, out of a very prestigious high school where I was supposed to study to be a very good scientist and, and serve the nation and all that. And so they expelled me and then, and then 
but they say you could stay here, uh, but we have to put your registration, your name, on another school's roster, and uh, in exchange, we're gonna take their top student and put it in in your place. Um, so you know, and I was I was just shocked that how can anybody not see me that um, and not love me for what I love. What I love is music. What I want to do with my life is to be with music. What I want to do is grow up to be like Yang Liqing, to be like my hero. That was really the only thing uh, that uh, kept me going in those days. So fast forward um, a little bit. Um, that's when I saw the injustice of the world and I couldn't help but being very torn uh, by and heartbroken by what I what I saw and what what that was, you know, um, is that I started to get angry. I, I I I couldn't I couldn't really concentrate on anything but to get into the music school of my dream, which is Shanghai Conservatory. Um, and I was so disconnected every day from morning to from the first minute of my waking hour to the last minute that I tried to stay awake. It was everybody around me saw me as this very strange person who had very strange ideas about life and about, and about things that they don't understand like music and art. So um, fast forward a few more years. So Yang Liqing passed away a few years ago and, uh, and I miss him to no end. And I don't think I can stop yearning for that feeling of being seen for my potential, being loved uh, for what I love and the musical fertility that he and I uh, shared. Uh, that relationship was the hay and my high school officials who expelled me was the spark. And soon I realized that I would rather die than putting out that flame in my belly. Um, so I've spent my life and career thinking about this kind of excruciating disconnection from an individual to the institution. Right? And uh, um, I do my best to fight for solutions and I've become, you know, highly opinionated about the state of disconnection in our field. Um, dare I say, this is personal. On the surface, you could think the other side of disconnection is connection. I argue that the word connection is um, like not exactly the whole picture. It's very impersonal. And it almost sounds uh, mechanical in, in a way. Um, so it begs the question, if two, two little elements, any element, be it musical notes, be it two cultures, uh, two individuals, uh, two, uh, uh, two different religion, uh, just two elements. Uh, and um, when they connected, so what is that relationship? What is the back and forth, right? And how do they interact? What is given, what is received? Um, and in other words, is this connection fertile? And if connection isn't the word, uh, then what is, you know? And so I settled on the word collaboration. I mean, <laughs> a, few, a few years from now, I might uh, say, uh, it's not enough, collaboration is not enough, that's entirely possible. But right now, um, I believe in collaboration and I've, uh, I'll show you hopefully um, a few things I've done. Okay, so uh, wrapping up this uh, little, pre little prelude uh, of my little story. So at the end of the day, you know, all I wanna know is do you love me? Do you love what I do? <laughs> uh, and uh, and I'm very greedy, you know. I I I never be satisfied if you just tell me once. <laughs> um, so yeah, 
that would be my uh, little prelude. So before I move on, I'm about to uh, show you uh, two very, very recent uh, collaboration. Um, and do you have any questions? I have time to answer one uh, from my chapter one. And you are welcome to type your question in the chat. And I think Peter has offered to uh, show them to me. If there are questions, just raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, I'm sharing screen, so I can't really see. I'll monitor the chat for you. And okay, if you have Peter. questions that come in, I'll pass them on. Great. All right. Shall we move on? Great. Okay, so uh, the first um, and foremost is that no composer can create alone. Um, I know that there is this very cinematic uh, idea <laughs> about composers, you know, who are just alone in the studio and in the in the little cabin in the woods and just blah 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 and then just you know produce um and then drawing inspirations like you know like some angels landing on their heads uh, yeah like i said it's very cinematic uh but i don't think most people uh who are music lovers or uh even colleagues my colleagues um would comfortably say that um, that composing, uh, especially doing creative work, is about as hard as it gets, and it is uh, it's that much harder if it you if you only do it alone. Um, so um, what I what you're looking at is just one of those projects that. I have no idea how it found me, um, but the the organist here, Mark Payko, um, he um, he asked me to write a piece for him, and then we met uh, together. And uh, I told him a little bit about me. He told me a little bit about him, uh, and it was not until the second meeting that he revealed to me that he had recently taken a trip to India and that he had suffered a uh, family tragedy and that he was carrying that tragedy with him uh, as he traveled through India. And I, I just looked at him like this, exactly this face. Mark, do you know that I have been like in love with Indian classical music for like 20 years? And then uh, he, he didn't know, he didn't know and I mean, how would he know? I mean, I haven't really done anything uh, about that uh, in my work. So I said, Mark, would you like to send me some some material with your trip and let me see if um, if it inspires me, if 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 it could work with this piece? And I understand pipe organ. You know, it's nowhere near what the in between notes. It's it's so like in in tune, you know, every note is so in tune. Um, so, so he started sending me all of his travel videos. Uh, and it so just happened that the world premiere was scheduled for the spring. So I activated my community of uh, Indian classical musicians. Uh, and uh, um, Apik Matriji is his name. Uh, he He's one of the sitar players that I, um, I've been uh, um, very taken by. Uh, I, love, I love what he does. So I called him up. I'm like, Apik, I need help. Um, so he just sat down with me and we talked about what raga. Uh, raga is a series of notes in different combinations that um, sort of the, the flavor of, of uh, it's, it's it's similar to scale, but it's but it's not not exactly scale. So a raga, and then and then he showed me three or four raga that is appropriate for the season spring. So I thought, wow, um, let me see what I can do about this. And then um, let me just show you that uh, I am an organist myself. Uh, so 
I love the instrument and I thought I already know the instrument very well because I play it. Um, so this is he and I working on the first, uh, I guess, 10 pages. It's not even finished. I was just sketching and I was like throwing stuff on the wall to see like what sticks. And then I just took this and I said, Mark, I need your help. Notice I've already said I need your help twice. <laughs> uh, and Mark started sight reading. Again, this is very courageous for a musician to do. Uh, and let me just play a little bit of... Um, So um, that was a moment uh, where I had this idea and I really didn't know what is uh, the best way. And then Mark introduced some elements as well and it completely changed the idea. And this was an exception when I was younger. When I was younger, I was very attached to everything I put on the page, everything I write everything I have the mind to justify, um, I didn't allow musicians to change or alter that much. But this little passage that you're hearing here um, is actually, we already shifted the voicing because Mark was showing me different stops and combinations where, hey, that top note is already covered by a stop. So you can use that top note and that finger for some other notes that will only make the color spectrum more rich. So would I know that if I didn't go to the instrument and work with him? No. Was he uh, the composer? No. But the piece would not, that particular moment, which is uh, where the entire piece landed, it would not have happened in this particular voicing. That just sounds so almost as perfect as it sounds in my mind without Mark's help. That's one collaboration. Another collaboration. Of course, uh, we're in a post COVID, uh, I guess before COVID-19 now, we're in the middle of COVID-19. So obviously this seems uh, undoable right now to be sitting you know, next to someone on an organ bench. Um, but I want to show you uh, the next, Ooh, the next one. The next one uh, was again, uh, this was actually earlier. This was last year before all the COVID-19 craziness. And uh, I was, I already felt very isolated without my musician friends around. So I was tasked to compose this solo guitar piece for a star guitarist who could pretty much play anything in the world. Very intimidating. And on top of that, uh, I knew nothing about guitar. And then I started uh, to do my studies. There was apparently not even a textbook about guitar. And then uh, I called up Sharon Isbin. I was like, Sharon, I'm so appreciative of you connecting me. Uh, to TY, um, can, you can you recommend a, a textbook, right? I mean, how many of you uh, composers uh, who are writing for instrument that you don't play, you don't know, and it's very difficult to see the choreography of, of the instrument uh, that you don't first go to a handbook or two to learn the mechanism mechanisms of the instrument you know that's like basic chops right and and that's that's when i discovered oh well there isn't much okay so i caught up ty i was like i think that's how it went down I was like ty i have no idea what i'm doing i know you're in the middle of nowhere in china on a tour 
he was. Um, and I said, I, I just want to see how you practice. Like, as basic as that, I do not understand how guitar is played. So the next thing I knew, he sent over 15 videos, 15 from all the way over in China. And I still have them. They're so wonderful. And this is one of the moments, and I'm going to I'm gonna play this. This is one of the moments where I wrote something and I wasn't sure about the particular articulation that is uh, possible. And then TY got back to me within two hours and made this video to show me what I just wrote. Hi, so uh, the four chords, um, if it started eight note, it should be something like this. So if it started, I mean, I mean, it's like staccato 16th note, okay. So there could be. So there are different lengths. And then right now I'm in Grand Rapids. Here is like zero Fahrenheit. And then um, so I'll be here for like three days and I can work on the piece, the page. And then also I'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'll be there for another four or five days. So I'll be have more time now. And thank you for like, your patience. Oh, correction, correction. I, so, so he was he was in Albuquerque, obviously. Uh, not China, but all the etude video came from China, I believe. Uh, and I think TY is here, and he can probably uh, recall a, a little more. Uh, but you know what? What I'm uh, this is these are two of my recent solo works. Uh, so this is a very personal collaboration, um, and. Uh, what I learned from this experience is that if I reveal my work early on, if I reveal my blind spots early on, most musicians are always ready and willing and very eager to show me. Um, and, you know, they've, and vulnerability actually reveals strength. I actually have very thick skin. I, I go, I, I go up to people and I, I really, I really don't know what I'm doing. So can you show me? <laughs> um, what's the worst, right? They'll just tell you, yeah, I haven't got time for you today. Go get lost. Uh, and then you come back. No doesn't mean no. No just means not now. Come back. So what I aspire to do, and this is a bit of, on the aesthetic uh, aspect of in-person, uh, collaborations is that um, I was very struck. I was having a Zoom cocktail hour with uh, one of my favorite pianists in the world, Mark Andre Hamlin, um, and uh, he just did a, a interview somewhere um, in and his new recording, I think, uh, of Cage's uh, prepared piano pieces. So I, I mean, of course, you know, I, I love the pieces, and I've known I've known them for many years. Um, since uh, I went to school and studied uh, the pieces, heard them live a few times. I thought I knew the piece very well, but again, Mark says something, uh, and this happens again and again. I hear musicians talk about their work, and it's just like, huh, I never knew. I never thought about it this way. And Mark said that the reason that made that piece so, he, he's so delighted and joyful when he plays that piece was because that, a, an entire percussion orchestra is under his fingertips, but they're not hard to play. They're easy to play. So uh, I'm going to stop a minute. Can you all think about this for a minute? Um, I can only speak for myself, but how many years have I spent in my studio alone and my ego is as big as the elephant in the room? And I was like, I'm going to write this piece to impress 
the rest of the world uh, with its virtuosity and with its well, masculinity and its stoicism and whatever it is, right? Whatever it is that uh, we usually feel, uh, I usually feel when I'm alone, stuck in the studio, um, you know, on a deadline. Um, but I don't, but ser seriously, um, all this is not even about the collaboration. It's not even about the musician. It's so much about me. Um, and what I want to do more in the future when I collaborate one-on-one -on -one with musicians is that I want to be able to achieve uh, that wonderful place where uh, music uh, is served better with uh, easier um, and more idiomatic um, technique. Uh, just musicians should enjoy playing my music. And when they enjoy, the music and not be so troubled about the techniques and about the, uh, uh, you know, about the virtuosity or, and about putting a hundred hours into practicing the piece. Um, something else happens, and it's inevitable. So I want to um, want to put this idea out there. Like, how many of you um, have had the experience where there's a little moment in your piece? Where it's relatively calm, relatively transparent, and every musician's like start sitting on the edge of their chair, you know, and they're just so excited uh, to be just vibrato, oh, just holding, holding a note on the E string, and they've been practicing vibrato for thirty years. They finally get to show off that vibrato. Anyway, so, um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about that, and. Um, uh, so, Gee. yeah, yes. We have a uh, TY is actually here. And, yeah. Uh, I wonder if he wants to tell us about his perspective on working uh, that way with you. It's a really interesting take on collaboration. It's really important. And the idiomatic part of uh, writing for instruments, you're right, liberates the performer to make their own music. TY, would you want to join us? TY! Hello, hi everyone. Hey. Thank you. Yeah. I really enjoyed your talk. It's not over yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I made it sound as if it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. You're still practicing my piece, right? Right here. Oh, you see, hey, I have just been paid the greatest compliment. I don't think Ty needs to practice my piece, and he's practicing my piece. Um, I have to tell, say that um, it was tough. Okay, so right now I'm uh, very seriously relearning this one because I dropped it for a period of time because of school and stuff. Um, this is such a cool piece, and then. As I think everybody knows, uh, we need to expand our repertoire as classical guitarists. And we were first, um, yeah, like we were collaborating with, not collaborating, we're begging for a composer to ask for us. Uh, and it's very nice of, uh, like, how do you say, uh, yeah, uh, asking, so what do you like? Um, but I, of course, I heard her work on the website, and they're very cool. I think what kind of unique as if this is, um, it sounds nothing uh, like any other uh, guitar pieces. Um, but it sounds like her. <laughs> Whatever that means, I hope, I hope you at least like me. <laughs> um. Thank you, Ty. Um, so actually, I'm not even done with talking about this piece yet, uh, because I think we're about to pivot into uh, the uh, collaboration with culture, which is something that uh, you know uh, that's also very true and present uh, in these two pieces. Um, okay, so I'm about to pivot. 
uh, before I pivot, I just want to say that for any of you who are interested in working for larger ensembles, uh, larger and as large as an orchestra, um, one of the things that work uh, very well, pretty much 100% of the time, is to make your music sight readable so that the musicians uh, can concentrate on the music making almost immediately because rehearsal time in uh, this country uh, is so precious. And uh, uh, that has been... Uh, Peter, there's some uh, noise here uh, in the room. I'm looking for it. Mm. Let me all see if we can find it. Is it uh, is Ty is Ty your uh, is your microphone still on? Uh, I think he's muted. Cool. All right. Now I'm gonna pivot. I'm pivoted. I have pivoted into uh, collaboration between cultures. So uh, this is a pretty big issue in especially composers uh, who don't look like who's my like myself you know I last time I checked I look completely Irish so why am I not writing Irish music right can I get some laugh out of this room please You're thank Irish. you absolutely okay so um so you know people wonder um you know why don't you write Chinese music. And if I knew this person, uh, I would tell them that, uh, first of all, my training is exclusively Soviet, European. Um, also, um, it, it's not that I don't appreciate Chinese music. Uh, I grew up with it and a lot of it. And it's not to what the Westerners and the Western uh, music world, it, that's not exactly Chinese music. Does that make sense? Uh, the Chinese food in China tastes nothing like the Chinese food in the US. Just use that as a reference point. So whenever somebody tells me, okay, you know, uh, what is Chinese music uh, is, is so, uh, actually, there are instrumentalists who has made a point of being that bridge, and that's their life's work, and it deserves a lot of attention and uh, recognition for that. Uh, woman comes to mind, uh, the pipaist woman. Uh, I was just talking to her uh, the other day, and uh, you know, so, um, but it's repertoire based, okay? So whenever there is a uh, a two culture that, that are holding on to their authenticity, they will seem inevitably very strange and far away from each other. So I have been uh, very careful in, in, this, in this combination. Um, so in my world, you know, if I'm just mimicking the idea or the surface without um, making, uh, let me back up a little bit, mimic the idea of another culture that is holding on to their authenticity, okay? Uh, without making direct reference to the surfaces that define another genre. Um, I think it's disrespectful for the people who are um, holding on to, to the authenticity of that culture. Um, and I don't particularly care for lifting other cultures artifacts and just casually plug it into our Western classical music. Uh, I would want to handle that very, very carefully and very, very respectfully. Um, because sometimes what we get is a, the sacrifice uh, of the authenticity of the both. So both end up losing their uh, authenticity. And, and, and that's, again, it's, it's my view. This is my opinion. Uh, this is how my ear works. Um, and this is not to say that I have not done 
a very expected cultural blend, like the uh, a Chinese instrument in the Western orchestra, or how about a Chinese melody with a Western instrument? All of that. I've done all of that, and uh, uh, some work I still believe in. Uh, some I don't think I did that very well. Um, I don't think I uh, honored the authenticity or the spirit of the other culture. Now, being a New Yorker, uh, I also have the entire New York uh, cosmopolitan and international uh, uh, demographic culture right in front of my plate. So uh, this collaboration with TY, um, you know, I guess, what, what can I write for this young man who could play pretty much anything. By the way, TY won the Guitar Foundation uh, competition, which is like the equivalent of the Clyburn uh, for in the guitar world, gold medalist uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. And um, so, 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 you know, this is, this is no, no, no small deal uh, to write a piece that would be interesting uh, to him. So at the time, um, I thought to myself, what would be challenging? This guy can play anything technically, right? But what about rhythm? So I had an idea that because I was studying uh, South Indian, uh, mostly Indian classical uh, rhythmic practice, and I was fascinated by that culture. So I'm going to exit this screen share and I'm going to share a video with you. Uh, that is the backbone of this piece that I wrote for TY. And you tell me whether that's challenging uh, or not. Bear with me. Share the screen. And right here, share system sound. There we go. Fasten your seatbelt, ladies and gentlemen.
Okay. Um, what had just happened? Um, yeah. So um, I lost my mouse. Here is my mouse. Okay. So um, you know the the thing is um, it's not that um, loving a culture. Uh, as much as you love your own culture is wrong. Um, and how much we know about our own culture and how much we know about other culture, uh, there's no end to any of this. So, so when we combine cultures, when, when I think about collaboration, um, I want to make sure, uh, and then I hope I succeeded in this piece, is that um, what drives both culture could interact in a way that is not superficial. And so that's been very important to me. And I think um, my ignorance uh, of the culture in the end, um, you know, the, the artwork, you know, the, the so-called, what I call the disrespectfulness of the other culture's authenticity is often the result of uh, some kind of ignorance of mine. I'm sure if I spend you know, another 20 years learning Indian classical music, uh, I might, I'm gonna continue to discover this amazing art form. But here's where I am. Here's, um, I have the love, I have the passion, uh, I have the zeal to, to love another art form. So, um, so that's where I am. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot more I haven't explored between the cultures and the chemistry uh, and the chemical reactions that are possible, the synthesis that are possible in these two musical cultures that are the Western and the Indian classical um, and that are just fertile for exploration and collaboration. So uh, that's the issue of authenticity. So Peter, uh, is there, I see there's like 24, finally I'm seeing there's 24 chat. Um, anybody has a burning question that I can answer right now in 25 words or less? I have a question. Okay. The last piece, as I was listening to it, I write a lot of percussion music. I said, this piece would be great to do on percussion. Now, if you did this as a percussion piece, how would that in any way either reflect the culture from which it came or denigrate the culture? Mm, great question. Um, first of all, uh, I would not choose percussion to be the, the instrument of this rhythmic idea because the rhythmic idea is percussive. Right, so I you, think could, you could do it for the I could. percussion. Oh, definitely. And then and that's yeah. what they did. That's what they did. Um, and the, the, the recitation is just preparation for uh, all the, the, the percussion instruments that they end up picking up. So, so that's true. So, and I uh, uh, highly recommend checking out uh, Dan Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -S, uh, who has been uh, almost translating the conical, which is the recitation of this rhythm into drum set. And actually he's not alone. Uh, Brooklyn Raga Massive have workshops every week on Zoom uh, on this topic. And, you know, world-class musicians have done amazing things uh, with uh, percussion. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, transform this rhythmic idea is to make it uh, work for a Western instrument that thrives um, playing lyrically, beautifully, and rubato, and without so much, you know, constraints to the rhythmic, uh, the percussiveness of this rhythmic uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, so that's when I, when I say collaboration, um, I want the 
I want the two to have a interaction. And the interaction is that what's great in the West um, is that, uh, you know, the, the instrument uh, has all these uh, uh, notes and the, all these notes that are very defined, like the guitar is a fret instrument. So that's a great, the strength and the characteristics of the Western uh, instruments, lots, lots of Western instruments um, that are fret and that are in tune, mostly in tune, strings and, uh, you know, um, other instruments uh, aside, um, I mean, the, the vials in, uh, aside. However, um, but if I only conform to the idea that this recitation is percussive, I feel like then I haven't uh, brought in enough of the instrumental part from the West, which uh, the, chemi the chemical reaction happens if this rhythmic recitation is, is working with pitches that are identifiable. So that's the part uh, that my ears were looking for. And I knew that that was so uh, difficult to achieve. And only one guitarist <laughs> that I was working with who could pull this off, and that was T.Y. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that that answers your question. And I, I think it's, uh, it's a really, uh, it's very intuitive. I also, you know, I hear this as percussive. Of course, I, I love it as a percussive um, uh, instrument the mouth is turned into a percussive instrument. So I didn't feel like it calls for another percussive instrument. I'm interested in seeing what happens if a melodic instrument, a harmonic instrument, which is what guitar is, um, can do with uh, what kind of dialogue these two could have. Uh, and the dialogue is the piece. So, gee, I think it's really great that you're creating something new. Like you mentioned, I mean, the the Western part of things is is the, the the discrete notes, right, and the idea of harmony. So, you weren't trying to write an Indian piece in any way. No, right? I don't so, think I can. <laughs> right, right, right. So what you what you were doing was was kind of the sum total of your experiences. And it's it's clear to me that you've done a lot of research to understand um, that the the rhythm from that point of view too, right? So maybe you can just talk a little bit more about how you find that balance of um, using uh, employing different things from another culture, but not trying to imitate or or uh, rip off another culture. Ooh. Mm. Twenty five <laughs> words or less. Ah. Oh. When you eat a piece of bread, you do not grow a muscle that looks like the bread. That, that's you like, have words left over now. Ah, oh, uh, I usually over talk and over compose. Very rarely do I under talk. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, think that, I think that's really interesting what you just said as kind of a joke, but I think it's really true. Maybe you could just elaborate on that, you know, when you eat a piece of bread. Mm. Um, I appreciate that, uh, Peter, you think that I did something new. Um, uh, I've, been, I've been favoring this word renew. Um, and I don't know that we can change. It's, first of all, it's nearly impossible to change people's mind. Um, and it's, even harder to change our own minds about things, hard enough to change our own minds about things. So I don't think there's much to be changed in an authentic culture that is like, uh, it seems like the other for us, the Western classical musicians. But I'm interested in uh, if we put them together, right? What could be renewed? So the word renew, that's, that gets me excited. Because you don't lose the identity. You don't lose the story. 
I'm actually quoting Margaret Atwood. Um, she once said that there isn't really a story that needs to be told. There, every story has been told, uh, and but the great writers, uh, they tell it anew. They tell it like news, and in their hands, the same stories is renewed, and it becomes today and fresh. It's 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 ours. It, it's our story. So I think about renew. I think about relive, um, and these are the worlds that uh, I'm inclined to explore. Um, so Mark Paco and I, we had this wonderful uh, conversation about the piece I wrote for him, and it also incorporated uh, Indian classical music elements. Uh, so he asked a very similar question, Peter. Actually, I don't know if he's here today, uh, but the. The question was that, you know, what was the biggest challenge? And, um, and I said to him, you know, uh, sometimes- Mark is here. You... Mark is here. Seriously? Yes, seriously. Hey, Mark. Hi, G. How's that elbow? Oh. Oh, oh, God. That, that actually happened not far from your apartment. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> I was I was up the bike path on the West Side Highway. Oh God! All right, uh, we have to drink to celebrate your uh, battle wound. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I I'm I'm actually I'm pretty hot on this line of thought. So Mark asked me, "What's the biggest challenge to incorporate um, raga for a basically a winged brass orchestra that's activated by fingertips?" You know. <laughs> That's the pipe organ. Um, and I said to him, uh, there's oil and there's vinegar. And if you combine oil and a vinegar, sometimes what you get is a salad dressing. Now, there's nothing wrong with a salad dressing. And there's a plenty of applications of a salad dressing. But what does it mean that there is a change uh, in both? that is worth this transformation. And I think heat, the process of cooking, that's, the, that's what is going to change the oil and the vinegar, any kind of oil and liquid, it will turn into a different substance. And, and that substance will include both the oil and the liquid. But the heat, the heat does the wonder. And where does the heat come from? It comes from the flame in my belly, to echo the beginning of my talk. But uh, the heat also comes from uh, knowledge and practice. Um, my first few projects of uh, imbuing and uh, combining or synthesizing uh, multiple elements uh, that otherwise would not come together was not success. You know, I've failed many times and all I can do is to fail better at this. And I can't say, and only the musicians can tell me whether uh, the musicians I'm writing for, in this case, Mark and TY, only they can tell me whether uh, this collaboration uh, what it means to them. And, and that's what I'm interested in. You know, I'm less interested in, oh, here's what I did. Look at me. Look at what I can do. You know, I'm less interested in, uh, I'm more interested in uh, the musician. And then, of course, when the musicians have learned uh, these pieces, they themselves become a collaborator. I can't wait to get this point. Uh, onto my slide, but, you know, me, the, but musicians, uh, organizations, everybody that we have the mind to write for and we're dependent on to, uh, to make the notes on our pages jump off the page and become reality, become music. Those are the work of musicians. And those are the works of people who enable these musicians to learn our works. And uh, uh, 
I I don't know that uh, you know people talk about this enough in music schools, that it it takes a tremendous amount of risk, to do a world premiere of a living composer's work. Uh, nobody knew what they're gonna get, and they all have to learn from scratch. There's no recording to study from. And then where is the composer, when the world premiere is supposed to happen, right? They arrive three days before. And then the rehearsal starts in the next hour, and the composer makes an appearance at the first half an hour. Next day, there's another half an hour, and then the next day is dress rehearsal, and then the next day is the show. So um, this is a real problem. Uh, for me, it's a real problem because I just can't wait to share with musicians uh, that I can't wait to tell them uh, that what I love about music and that the reason that I endured so many years of the labor and the solitude of composing, uh, which most of the time does not have any sense of instant gratification, is because of them. It's because I get to imagine, hey, these notes are gonna fly off this page in the hands and the musicianship of so-and-so, so-and-so. And that gets me going. And I ask myself this all the time. Like, is it really that I'm stubborn? Well, I am stubborn, you know, but uh, my will can only take me to a certain point. I have to love something. I have, to, I have to believe in something. I have to be able to envision something. I have to like something enough to endure this much uh, solitude and uncertainty in my work. So musicians, I've been very, very lucky. Um, but I've also learned my lessons the hard way. I used to hide from musicians. Uh, I used to think that they were hostile to me because they didn't like my music or they didn't like me. Um, but you know what's the greatest icebreaker? <laughs> hey, can you show me what this sounds like? Just show them. Nine out of 10 times, almost 10 out of 10 times, they get really excited because you paid attention to them. You paid attention to the instrument they love. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm very, very fortunate. And I feel like today I'm also surrounded by musicians and, uh, you know, the community, wonderful feeling right at home. Uh, so how are we doing on time? 4.07. Hmm. I am debating whether um, I should skip a slide and just dive straight into the grand finale. <laughs> uh, I know that there are, there are a few people who'd love to talk and ask some questions. So maybe mm -hmm. the grand finale and we can have the grand inquisition right after that. All right. <laughs> the grand inquisition. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm thinking about Eddie Izzard and uh, and his uh, his his routine on the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, no, that's 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 too extreme. Okay, <laughs> um, share screen and this and system sound. Okay, so. Um, Hands up, you can see my slide that says the issue of authenticity. Wonderful. Moving forward to the skipping, skipping. So this leads me to uh, the work that have sustained me artistically for the last uh, six or seven years. Um, my collaboration with musicians and with, oh, hello. This program's got the mind of its own. Okay, so <laughs> uh, of course, you know, I've been working, always working. I've been very lucky. I've always worked with musicians uh, of the highest caliber ever since Manhattan School of Music. Um, and then I went to Curtis um, and uh, boy, the, the talent in that place. Um, and then um, I've been very lucky that I have not had a year uh, went by that I, 
wasn't invited to write for a particular group of musicians. So I've had very um, regular and frequent practice. But the kind of collaboration that vivified my work in the last few years really just started a few years ago. Um, and so um, I started going to conferences and I did a lot of theater work. I did, uh, I did opera work um, and I started to uh, talk to people um, in the rooms where it's forced these, um, uh, these suits. Uh, they're very intimidating in the conference rooms. Uh, the conference people, they organize it so that I am like sitting right in the middle of this conference table as the composer. And I discovered that uh, they have no idea, the big suits, they have no idea what I do, or um, they don't even know what to think or what to say to me. Um, so that got me thinking, huh, what if I uh, start asking different questions? Are they interested in what I have to say, what I have to review? So I begin revealing. Um, ever since that, I think the first piece that I, uh, I, I can recall that I consciously had to work through how much am I willing to review was my work uh, at the prison, uh, at the Minnesota Correctional Facility at Shakopee. And, and that's an environment where uh, they don't have to cooperate with me at all. They don't have to take me seriously, which some of them didn't at first. Um, so I, I, I got confronted like right at the beginning. I was in a room with uh, 10 or 11 prisoners uh, and they, you know, I, I knew what they did. I, I understood uh, very well that uh, what got them in the place. Um, and one of them, you know, very suspiciously asked me, what do you want from us? Uh, and I knew that was the moment that I had to just come clean. And I, I, I said to her, and I'm paraphrasing, because I had to really wing it, of course. And I said to her, you know, I'm really not sure. I don't think I have a reason to do what I do, but all I know is that I have been given and I've been at the receiving end of a tremendous amount of generosity and love. And, uh, and I don't have to do anything, but I'm here. I'm here to just share what I love with you, which is music, which today we're talking about counterpoint. Yeah, I taught counterpoint courses in a woman's prison. Uh, and the entire room went silent. Um, and I think the key word was, I don't have to, but I'm doing it. And I don't really know why I'm doing it. I still don't know why they opened up to me after that. So that project tells me that if I can just be okay with my status of vulnerability and, uh, uh, and uh, ignorance, um, and all of the stuff that I carry with me that I don't even know how to put into words yet. If I can communicate that in ways that are transparent, in ways that are simple to understand, in ways that are uh, just true, I think, I think a lot of people would respond strongly to it with something even more valuable which I got from the prisoners. Um, if I went in with the intention that I'm gonna get the story out of them, what am I gonna get? Nothing. They don't have to cooperate with me. They're under no summon to cooperate with me. But having said what I said to them, they started talking. And two hours later, my librettist and I, we had enough material to write our opera, which we did. Um, we discovered there uh, that they are not animals behind cage, 
that there are mothers, daughters, sisters. Uh, so we decided on uh, a story where um, one of them, the mother, it's Mother's Day. She's waiting for her annual visit from her daughter. Will the daughter show? The prisoner mother. Okay, so this is what we discovered from uh, my work. And that was so life-changing for me. And I think after that, all my concerns, all my insecurities about, you know, so-and-so might not like me if I do this. You know, I go to an orchestra and uh, uh, they have a function they want me to go to. Um, and I was like, oh, if I say this, if I do this, maybe they'll not like me. Maybe, uh, you know, what can I do to make the organization look great and blah, blah, blah. Forget it. Forget it. I just show up and I just, hey, um, we, we have a common goal here. We love music. And what can we say about this? Let's put our minds together. So this graph that you're looking at here was pre sort of pre prison visit <laughs> uh, the before prison visit right composer in the little corner with our creativity and then voila there's the masterpiece and the musicians like oh god i can do it i can do it i can do it all right um i'll learn it i'll learn it oh this is so hard oh i have questions should i ask the composer but if i ask the composer is the composer gonna be like so like all hostile to me you know is the composer going to think i'm stupid that i don't know how to read this music um and then the musician presents uh this piece to the audiences that are all part of a community community is going to be the key word moving forward um the, you know since covid19 the board the administration uh that nurse and uh, the, the, the big picture of the music culture. So what I want to do, uh, and I was very wrong. I think this is uh, uh, closer to what I have in mind about collaboration uh, with bigger organizations. The composer with bellies on fire. The composer can be replaced with artists, all disciplines. Yeah, we're at, we're at the generating state. We generate the heat. If, if composers do not compose work, there will not be any of the musical culture that we celebrate today. So composer at the middle and the gear, too bad this is not an animation. So my fingers are animating right now. So the gear are all turning in a different speed and they change all the time and the composers are the gear the artists are the gear that turns everybody and you don't know you don't know maybe the musician will turn it and in my experience with the two collaborators in the room today mark Pakel and ty um they also generated some momentum that turned all the other one, two, three, four, five, six gear, including mine. So there's all these back and forth, back and forth. And of course, there's no way to tell which gear is generating the energy, the momentum, but every gear is turning. But the flame, the flame is possibly uh, gonna be where it starts. And it's the artists and composers' responsibility to show the world that we have flame in our belly and that we want to collaborate with the musicians and the music public. Peter, I, uh, hmm? I run out of things to say. Well, that's, you've said a lot, but it's, you've said so much that's so interesting. You know, for me personally, as, as a composer, uh, it seems to me what you're talking about here with collaboration and what you're bringing to the table is kind of a, a, a really stunning combination of 
enthusiasm and vulnerability, both. You know, there's a kind of honesty, and 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 what you were saying in the prison, you know, you could just you could just keep the walls up, but by letting the walls down, you invite people in. Uh, and to me, that's something really beautiful that I'm taking away from your talk today. So thank, thank you, thank you, Peter, for me. Yeah, a couple of people had some comments and questions um, mm -hmm. regarding what you were talking about, kind of cross-cultural composition, yeah? Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll just read a couple of those comments. Mm -hmm. um, there were two, and then you could kind of ruminate and, and, and uh, let us know what you think. Mm -hmm. So Stan says, on one level, I agree with what Wang Jie is setting. Uh, I can think of many examples of composers using sometimes quite directly musical elements of other cultures. Debussy comes to mind. Regarding jazz, Stravinsky comes to mind. Any thoughts? No need to answer now. Sometimes I wonder about fusion cuisine. Personally, I can't stand it. <laughs> uh, and then uh, let me let me just read Ben's comment that he makes in in response to Stan, and then um, we can uh, we can talk. Uh, ben says, "I don't know if this directly answers the question directly, Stan, but regarding this authentic approach to material being discussed versus reference." I recalled this line by composer Wieland Hob Hoban. While it is naive or disingenuous to rely on exotic references for effect, being faced with an artistic approach that is in some way very different to one's own should make one realize that other traditions achieve results that one's own cannot. Far from animating the composer to appropriate foreign material, it can show one just how much could be still be developed within one's own musical language. So there's a lot there. Mm. Love to know what you think. Mm. So um, I'm so glad uh, Stravinsky is uh, mentioned. Uh, Stan, thank you. Um, so he's uh, he's one of my absolute uh, musical heroes, and I think it was also him uh, who said, not in these exact words, that music is not capable of expressing anything else but itself. So uh, the whole slide that I, I, uh, I skipped uh, was a uh, philosophical concept uh, from Suzanne Langer, uh, who was like the founding mother of modern metaphysics. Um, and she uh, talked about, um, elaborated on uh, the idea that music um, is symbol. It's not really language vernacular. But so like we hear this all the time, right? Music is a kind of language. It's it's kind of this casual phrase that starts a lot of textbooks for music 101. <laughs> um, but, but I think I think um, there's a lot to it. There's a lot more dimensions to this statement. I think all languages are variants of music. Uh, contours of languages, uh, especially, and uh, but um, whatever this cultural uh, idiosyncrasy uh, that our ears can pick up, um, for me that sits where the dialects happen. It's a special kind of flavor, and that flavor, you know, you can speak. I can speak English. Um, and I can more or less pass as a, a, a you know, a, a relatively okay English speaker. Um, and I have some mild accents that I'm aware of. I can't hear it very well. Uh, but when I speak Chinese, I do not have any accents. Uh, that's why I was a broadcaster and I'm a voiceover actress in Mandarin. Um, and I've worked, uh, I've worked a lot as voice actress because I do not carry an accent. So I think there's um, a lot to unpack uh, in like, okay, so there's a cultural reference, there's a accent, you know, a lot of performers, uh, actors in particular, uh, they need to learn the, di the, the, the accents of, of their skin color and their face. Um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm just handling it with extra care now that I am at this stage of my creative output. Uh, what I want to know is 
uh, it's almost Wittgensteinish. You know, uh, here's here's why this linguistic lineage has come to a dead end, and and this is why we're holding on to its authenticity, its accent, its cultural idiosyncrasies, and everything that comes with it. Okay, uh, and then the other cultural uh, heritage is like. Oh yeah, we're doing that too. You know, it's not easy to care to hold on to that uh, that thing. You know, a lot of cultures they just extinct. So, these two, you put them together. Whose accent you're gonna use? So, um, so I'm interested in like whether something renews both of them, and that is if I can relive uh, these two cultural elements and through my reliving do i have the power the heat to transform both into something uh, that can only be comprehend that is inclusive of both but can only be comprehend in this final form that i created having relived both cultural elements um that's the best way I can put it. I mean, I don't know. Tomorrow, I might drink a different brand of coffee and then I'll be like, I don't know what I was talking about yesterday. I think I'm going full on, you know, Chinese accent. Uh, no. I think that's, that's really great. Um, you know, I think in addition to that enthusiasm and vulnerability, there's, there's a kind of humility in the way that that you are thinking about all of these different kinds of music that I think is is necessary and and really um, gives your work a lot of integrity in that way. Oh, um, thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, this course. is this is so uh, important for me. You know, I remind myself all the time that uh, I'm able to get anywhere in my career uh, is because somebody I don't know who. Uh, some somewhere sitting on some panel I don't know about and decide to cut me some slack. Mm. You know, uh, this this work that we do as artists, uh, it's never, it's never going to be, it's never over. It's There's always room for uh, expansion and uh, different types of concentration, you know. Um, and you know, I, I don't know that uh, I'm done with this period of just taking on everything that comes on my plate. Uh, I have a few focus right now, but I'm already operating at my capacity. And this is the work that I have been uh, able to accumulate uh, only up to this point. Um, and this is possibly a good prediction of my future where uh, you know, what I already know, I want to expand on, I want to make more, uh, want to make it more rich, and I want to make it more accessible. You know, there's like, it's very three dimensional, and it's always a network type of, it's never linear. You know, it's not like I've done with my period right now, and I'm moving on to the next period. It's not like a, you know, slideshow. So um, I think what I've done in the past will always be with me. And it will Hopefully, uh, if I take good care of myself and if everybody loves me, and then I'll be able to renew and I'll be able to pass, pass that love uh, through my collaborations with the rest of the world. Right? That's really uh, beautiful. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. You know, just before, uh, as we wrap up, um, Paulo had uh, asked if he could ask a question. And I just wanted to make sure that we... Um, get a chance to hear from Paulo. Paulo, ciao. Hello, Wenji. Wow, thank you so much. It was really inspiring what you said. I totally agree with you, and it's really beautiful the, your idea of collaboration. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, I just wanna tell you if I can a little thing regarding like authenticity because I'm foreign like you. I'm Italian, and I totally understand your point of view and. Um, is a very important question that all of us composers and artists we we ask to ourselves. I have the idea that I mean, listen to your music or what I heard. I don't know all of your works, but I heard I, I heard some. 
I, I truly feel that your music uh, sounds to me authentically Chinese, but in a good way. I'm not saying in a bad way. Uh, so I think that the fact that you, um, this is because, not because you try to be Chinese using Chinese elements or whatever, but because you bring it with yourself, with your music, your past, your experience, and your true self. So I think the way, th this is the key. Because I was thinking about uh, even like uh, examples of composer using Chinese elements, like Debussy, Stan was mentioned, Debussy, but also uh, Puccini, for example, in Turandot. Both of them use Chinese elements, but Puccini sounds really Italian, <laughs> and Debussy still sounds really French. At the same way, I think our music, your music, even if you use um, um, Indian element or whatever you want to use, always, uh, I think we sound truly uh, your music. That is the key. That is the good thing of what you are doing. And also another thing I want to add very briefly, the idea of collaboration remind me what in visual art, uh, some artists already are doing nowadays. In music for us is more difficult. This idea of making the gear moving around us. So it's not only up, up to us, but we activate something around us. I saw um, a documentary about a great artist, the Indian, actually Indian, but also British, Anish Kapoor. I don't know if you know him. And they showed his studio. He has like a, a lot of collaborators. So he actually, he doesn't do, he just give ideas and then other collaborators realize his works. Of course, in music is not totally possible that, but this idea to open to other people, to receive influence from other people and give uh, maybe the first input and to make them work of art together is very fascinating and maybe it's the future of music. So thank you so much. I, I don't want to talk too much, but thank you. It was really nice what you said and inspiring. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, uh, I, can, I can talk to you more about this off the, off the meeting, but uh, I think I'm running out of time. I do have a thought which uh, I can't wait to, uh, to pick your brains. Um, brains, you do, yeah, two, two sides of the brain. Yeah, brains, yeah, so. Great, this, this is really, really fantastic. Um, thanks so much. If you're just joining us, we're just wrapping up a wonderful talk with Wanji, composer, and um, Fred Child is gonna be doing his talk in just a minute. I just wanted to take this chance to say thank you so much for a really inspiring talk and for all of your inspiring um, questions and I could just feel the energy and everybody really got so much out of this. Thank you so much. Let's give a big round of virtual applause. Thank you everyone. That was fun. Uh, I can see all of your faces, which means a lot to me. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. Thank you again.